Is his name Guts because he's brave? Is that how it works? I think also because he, like, disembowels people. Yeah. A little col- I guess a little column A, a little column B. Is his name Griffith? <laughs> Is his name Griffith? Because... <laughs> I just keep going back to Peter Griffin. Original family guy. (laughs) Oh, boy. I mean, Peter did have a lot of jokes. A lot of people forget that Peter's first job was as a... um, He worked in a toy factory, of all things. Uh, Now he works in a brewery. I guess he could have been uh, an eagle along the way. That's what they're called, right? Uh, The Band of the Hawk. Hawk shit. Damn. Not at all caught up on Family Guy lore. <laughs> I was. Uh, like, just read the first few chapters of Berserk. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Sounds about right. Read the manga. That's what they say. Rev up those fryers and fill those champagne glasses to the tippy top. It's West Coast toast and roast with Tommy, Will, and Dad. Uh, welcome back to West Coast Toast and Roast. I'm the leader of the Band of the Eagle, because I meant to join the Band of the Hawk, but got lost on the way, Tommy. Uh, and I'm the person who is going to betray all of you to attain godhood, Will. And I'm the spooky dev. Ooh. Probably won't be spooky time by the time this goes up, though. That's no, a shame. I- I'm going to try for tomorrow, but we'll, well see. Either way, we're recording this on Halloween. Uh, I dressed up as Terry Bogard. Did you uh, dress up as anything, Tommy? Oh, get a, so get a load of the. Did you see my, my stories? Do you know the answer to this? When did you, po- did you post them on Snapchat or Instagram? Uh, just Instagram. Um, oh. No, I did not. Go ahead. So, Mike, I have, a t- you know, I have my uh, teacher's team, and they want to do Snow White and the Seven Dwarves because there's eight of us. And since I'm the only man on the team, the initial idea was that I would be Snow White. Uh, But our ELD teacher um, already had the Snow White dress. So we decided, so, and she really wanted to be Snow White. So I settled for being the magic mirror instead. And what did that costume look like? It was, um, someone found, uh, one of my coworkers found me, um, it was like, the cape drapes over my shoulders and back, and the mask goes over my face, and it looks like a reflective mirror. It's covered in a material that I can see through, but from the other way, they can't. They just see their reflection. Interesting. Okay. Did you yeah. save those pictures, or? Um, yeah, I've got one. I, can, uh, I guess I can send it to you right now. It's not like it would interrupt the record. And then, uh, Dad, did you have any... Uh... Uh, yeah, I went as uh, Mystique from X Men, but disguised as a twenty-two-year-old diabetic. Ah. <laughs> well, do you have? You want to start us off? You as always. Uh, sure. So, uh, I guess now's as good a time as ever since this is recorded on Halloween. I would like to roast Halloween Kills. Um, that is uh, probably one of the worst sequels to a pretty good reboot I've ever seen. Um, I don't know if Dab, did you see it? Uh, I didn't see it, but I saw enough clips from it to know it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's such a shame, because that reboot, could, the first reboot could have been a lot worse, and it wasn't. Yeah. It was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I like. I liked it fine when I was in the theater, but the more anyone remotely dissected that movie, I was like, oh, yeah, that, that was pretty fucking stupid. Yeah, the, the thing is, number one, nothing happens in that movie. Like... Everything that happens is of no consequence. Um, Number two, it's basically just the things that does happen is people just saying the same thing over and over. If you took a shot every time they said 40 years ago or evil dies tonight, you'd be dead. Um, You know, I do like Michael Myers. He's kind of the original slasher. Um, That being said... uh, you know, Halloween Kills, definitely, probably, uh, one of the worst Halloween movies out there. Which is saying a lot, because there's some bad ones. Yeah. Um, I think the, is, the thing that is indicative of it, this is, people were laughing in the movie theater when this happened, mm-hmm. is there's a scene where someone tries to shoot Michael. Michael is in a car, and he kicks the door open, which somehow, it hits the lady with the gun. 
and causes her to turn the gun around and shoot herself. <laughs> That's great. And I think funnier than that was the old lady with the gun who's like, this is for Dr. Loomis, you monster. And she pulls the trigger and nothing happens. Yeah, that she just dies immediately. That has the um, timing of like a Looney Tunes joke. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a joke of a movie. Yeah. There's the awful... There's just the awful nostalgia baiting that's in every fucking movie now, where they spend the opening being like... It's like, uh, friggin' Tommy from the very first movie is like 40-ish now, and, and he's like, oh, how could I forget? 40 years ago. So he's like 48, I guess. And he's like, and in the crowd tonight are this person from this one movie, and the, a big light, like, shines on them, and this person, and this babysitter from the movie that survived, a big old light shines on them. Which is, uh, it's super weird, though, because, I mean, in the context of this universe, this, sh like, this event shouldn't have been a super big deal. I mean, like, five people died. It's like, there are worse serial killers out there. Honestly, yeah, and they're like, Michael Myers has terrorized this town for 40 years, but for 40 years, he's just kind of been in prison. Like, he, he hasn't really done anything. And I think, um, I've been listening, I can't recommend enough the podcast Blank Check. They do, they do miniseries based on filmographers, or filmographers, sorry, directors. And right now they're in their John Carpenter one. And, like, I was always like, yeah, Halloween is good. But their Halloween podcast really uh, dissects how that basically invented the slasher. Um, and it's the reality of the situation that makes it scary. And this makes... Michael should seem unnatural, and that's what makes him scary, but I don't feel like people should be acknowledging it to this extent. Yeah, they're like, uh, I mean, I think it did well in the first, it's an old movie, I'm fine with spoiling it. Mm. When they shoot Michael, he falls out the window, and then they go when the body's not there. That's a perfect ending. And John Carpenter didn't want it to become a franchise. But now they're like, he gets, you know, shotgunned in the face. He gets, like, stabbed. He gets his arm cut off. And he, <laughs> like, he's just kind of fine. Yeah. They, can I praise one thing about this movie um, that doesn't look, carry it far in my rating? One thing they have spot on is that there's a point where everyone's locked down. Michael's out and about. And um, I, think, I think one of the old babysitters finds two kids at the playground. And they're, like, not taking it seriously. And as you know, as a teacher, that is precisely how children today would act in that fucking situation. They're like going, "Oh, Michael Myers gonna get me? Not today, Satan!" And they're like talking in YouTube voices. Whoever wrote <laughs> that bit has such a thorough understanding of like twenty twenty one children. Because <laughs> I just was like, "Yeah, no, that's that's how dumb kids would be today." I teach over a hundred of them each day. <laughs> yeah, I. Right. Uh... If uh, uh, growing up in the age of the internet is going to have irreparable damage to today's youth, I mean, look at us. Yeah, did Webkins did. is a gateway drug. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look at this. Dav, you know, started off on the internet. Now he's got diabetes. Yep. Ugh. Anyways, uh, I guess I will pass it to the Shermanator. Oh, it's usually Dav's turn now. Okay, then I will pass it to Dav. Okay. So, um, I'm pretty sure I didn't talk about this last time because I don't think I watched it by then, but, uh, Squid Game? I gotta give it a thumbs up, man. It's a it, okay. really good show. How I would you it's... rate it on a scale of 1 to 10? Uh, personally, I'd give it a 9. Wow, um, interesting. I think objectively it's more like a 7 or an 8, but I, I honestly really enjoyed it, so I'll give it a 9. I... I'd love to dis uh, discuss that because I actually wasn't crazy about it um, because I'm known for having bad opinions. But I, um, wh why don't you go ahead? I don't want to completely overhaul your your hour. Sure. I mean, it, it just kind of takes the normal uh, death game formula and uh, does some interesting things with it. Um, it has a message that is kind of clumsily delivered, but it's still respectable, I guess. Uh, and that message being? Uh, capitalism bad. Yeah, overall, I mean, just the, the show itself is super entertaining to watch. Uh, it does falter a little bit towards the end uh, mm -hmm. when they start messing up with, like, the... I wasn't as bothered by the VIPs as uh, most people seem to be. I thought they were pretty funny, but, you know, overall, um, 
super great show. Super good ways of uh, sending messages. I hope to God it doesn't ever get a season two. It does oh, not need one. It really well, does. you know they're gonna, but it really doesn't. Um, is this the fact? I mean, I, season two and the fact that they're like planning merchandise, like Funko Pops and shit, is uh, pathetic. It does not need to happen for this show. It shouldn't. Um, I guess like what I want to lead off with is that I'm super happy this is successful, even if it wasn't really my thing. Because I, you could, I never could have guessed in a million years that like an offbeat kind of surreal Korean TV show would be like number one in Netflix. And I'm True. Like, I'm always gassing myself off on how everything looks the same lately and people just want the same old shit. So it's a little hypocritical of me that I, I'm like just kind of not a little down on it. The thing is, I love the character. I think the main guy is so great. He is so fucking Oh, good. he's awesome. He's like the best protagonist they could have picked for that. He's great. I love the older lady, too. I think she's awesome. Uh, I guess where, I kind of, where I'm kind of coming from is that I feel like with the, de- the death game subgenre, it's really most entertaining when you have a very specific set of rules. And I feel like the rules of the squid games um, get consistently very... Like, they're just a bit vague. Like, there's a whole plot point where you can... People get up in the middle of the night and kill each other, and it's just like, that's just a thing you can do. And at that point, why wouldn't the strongest people just murder? All, like, why? Like, that just felt like such a weird and kind of clumsily handled idea. Um, well, yeah, but I think that sort of goes into hand with the message about, um, like, the authority in charge is uh, can't really be trusted to protect. And, and also, it was sort of... I mean, I, I won't go, go into spoilers or anything, but it was sort of orchestrated to be uh, sort of ambiguous on purpose with the rules. Yeah. I guess related to that spoiler, I do not love that ending it being as vague as possible. I think that the ending is exactly what I would expect from that character. I mean, I, and I'm talking about like the very, very end, like the last scene. Mm-hmm. Just based on what we know about that character up until that point, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Uh, but yeah, yeah. The episode like up until that was kind of bullshit. I that's I do mean I do specifically mean the plot twist there. Yeah, the plot twist was completely unnecessary and didn't mean uh, anything, and it was it was dumb. Was but just, I'll just ignore it. I think they were supposed to kind of be like what, but I was just kind of like oh okay. I guess. <laughs> like whatever. I don't. <laughs> Yeah, and then there's shit like in the and then kind of in the honeycomb game, the one the one lady is uh, using a lighter to uh, heat up her needle and try and cut it out, but she kind of acts like she needs to hide it. First, I don't see how you could hide anything in such a tightly secure area. But they also never specify if she does need to hide it, and then it just kind of makes it all kind of. I just didn't feel clear on where anyone was coming from in that moment when she was trying to hide you know what i mean like well, i think the point there was that it was smuggled in so they weren't sure if that was supposed to be okay but yeah yeah i maybe that's just me being like i see what yeah i i guess like when you have stuff like uh i'm gonna get crucified for saying this stuff like dangan ronpa i think works so well because you can count on rules meaning life or death but in squid game it's like you could even leave for a day and then everybody comes back and it's fine we'll just keep going you know you know what i mean i mean honestly i love that that part of it where they leave and still choose to come back i think that really plays into the message well i like that part i do i'm gonna second tommy and say the the lack of certain rules kind of was like well I mean, I guess that, and I, I, I agree with you also, Daph, that it contributes to the message, but also as an audience member, it kind of made me be like, well, guess anything goes. Yeah, that's true. I get that. And honestly, when I, w- when I was watching it, I was thinking more along the lines of, like, how does this particular aspect of the game play into the bigger metaphor of, like, society? But um, it, and it, I guess that sort of helped me, like, excuse certain things about it like oh yeah of course the authority is corrupt uh the 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 one major thing that i really really did not like and i'm just i'm still giving it a nine because i'm kind of like ignoring this part of the whole plot anything involving that detective dude was so fucking stupid 
Uh, it didn't really have any weight at the end. It, like, it was just kind of a subplot that didn't go anywhere. It was exclusively there to, I think, set up the sequel. I have, like, practically zero memory of that character. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, for all the shit I talk, I do think it does... I, it makes me happy that something like this has become... Like, even, like, my students, who are probably way too young to be watching this Yeah, Tommy, shit. you really need to, like... Why are you letting them watch that in class? What, in class? Yeah. No? Yeah, Dying I mean, it kind of... It sure sounds like... It sure sounds like you are. Listen, they all have their own laptops, and I walk by, and they're looking at... Cool. Yeah, you mind right. if I take, do you mind if I take the wheel from there? Did you want to... Yeah, I'll pass it off to you. That's pretty much all I got to say about it. All right. Um. So last time we recorded, Will anticipated me... Uh, speaking about something I was really excited for, and I said I wanted to hold off till now. Do you remember what that is, Will? Um, <laughs> diapers and vor. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> Here, let's let's read you that. Um, just so you can cut it out. No, I yeah, believe I, it, I, it was it know. was it last night in Soho. No, no. Um, it was Nickelodeon All Star Brawl. Oh, all right. Then take it away. All I can say is, people anticipated this would be a Smash killer, and if you look at Twitch right now, Smash Ultimate is still in the thousands, and there's, like, single digits of people playing Nickelodeon all I heard it was, like, one. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's be- the, I think that's the viewers. Like, there's only one person watching <laughs> Nick All-Stars. <laughs> and it's me, because I do quite like the game. Uh, this is indeed a toast, uh, as funny as it is. It, it's really, um, you know... I've been playing, if you walk into this game with Super Smash Bros. muscle memory, you're not going to be totally lost, but it, it changes just enough that you need to readjust. And that's kind of what really engaged me about it. Um, even just small things, like there's a different jump button, drew me off and forced me to kind of reassess and not just play mindlessly. And that that small bit alone went a long way in really uh, capturing my interest in this game. It's true that it's low budget and, you know, some cut corners are very, very noticeable. But I think they really succeeded in making a addictive brawler where uh, experimenting with each character felt so rewarding in learning about each one. You know, bearing in mind that I've been playing Smash since 64, like, I'm sure those characters all have unique mechanics and are so, so different and, like buried but you you just get to take it for granted when you get as old as i am and just so used to it this something about this felt so fresh i was really happy with how it turned out who are you playing so my big mains are reptar and lucy loud um for entirely different reasons reptar is like the steamroller he is like just all about the he is exactly what he looks like he's all about raw power Some people compare him to Bowser, but I think that is purely an aesthetic similarity. He reminds me, he's a little more like King Dedede, um, with just how high risk some of his recovery and projectiles are, but insanely high reward, because he can just completely knock away your percentage. And then there's Lucy, who is a, like, fascinating character. Um, Her neutral special is a bite attack, which changes her from normal to ghost to vampire mode, and this disposition completely changes how her moveset works. Um, I'm, like, I I find, like, I spent my whole, uh, flight to and from Florida just trying out character after character. Only a small handful felt like duds, or like, you know, obviously Spongebob is very straightforward. Uh, Leonardo just has his swords. He isn't, he, he's functional, but not terribly interesting. Almost everyone else is, I think, fascinating in context of a fighting game. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, did you want to add on? I'm just going to say, yeah, I, I still think the game looks ugly, but also, like, it's, you know, probably got the budget of a toaster, so I can't really blame them for that. Um, not too many. I think the big reason I didn't pick up, there's not really any character besides Leonardo that really catches me. You well, at the risk of coming off as untoward, are you even that big a Nickelodeon fan? A lot of Nick shows that I do like. Like I loved Avatar, but you know, I also think I mean I guess Aang is also kinda cool, but I, you know, don't really care about Toph. 
Um, I was more fan of, yeah, I was more a fan of, you know, Zuko, Uncle Iroh, um, even Sokka. Um, you know, Iroh would be fantastic. <laughs> well, if you could get like a tea drink healing attack, that'd be fun. Yeah. That being said, I know Garfield has been leaked for this game, and unironically, <laughs> that is a fantastic decision. That is so fucking hype. They, di- they data mined Garfield on the same day Sora was revealed for Smash. And that's maybe the most cursed combination of characters. Yeah, which also, I know the game came out the day that Sora was revealed, so that also probably, you know, killed some hype. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they said there's going to be, the first two DLC characters are going to be free, and it's basically been all but proven that they're Garfield and Shredder, which is a lovely sentence to be able to say. Yeah, Shredder, that has me engaged. I love Shredder. Absolutely. That's pretty cool. Um, gosh, just, I could, like, any number of characters I could go... Nigel Thornberry is a terrifying combination of Captain Falcon and Jigglypuff. In that his <laughs> That's moves, awesome. His moves are slow as all get out, but his neutral B... Because his, his, uh, the motif of his moveset is all about imitating different animals. His neutral special is imitating a fish and shadow catting through any attack without being harmed and finding himself on the other side. So if you time that exactly correctly, you can deal his, like, absurd damage that you couldn't normally because of his lag. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. It's great. Uh, hell, like, it's just shit, like, how did you even think of this? Like, how Helga Pataki has her, her neutral special is just a slingshot that defies gravity and knocks an opponent toward you. So she has these heavy, long-lagging moves, too, that you can literally catapult your foe towards you and wind up with them. It's finding the bread-and-butter strategies like those that make this game, like, super rewarding. I know the dev team pretty huge fans of Melee, so I, I know they set out to make, like, a good competitive game, so... Yeah, um, a couple characters are already... I think Michelangelo already has an infinite, and he had to be banned for a while. Oh, lovely. Um, I kind of just love being having a game on the scene that lets me say sentences like, oh, most people say cat dog is really broken. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, that about... I guess what does suck... You know, like I said, there's no voice acting. Some characters look a lot better than others. But the big thing that they dropped the ball on in terms of, like, how they could have used their budget is that in the arcade mode, there's opening quotes. They get a text box of um, something they're, they say to each other. And when I first heard about this, I was like, oh, they may not have voice acting, but maybe they can just write some fun dialogue. And I thought it'd be specific, like, maybe if... um. I don't know, Spongebob is fighting Cat Dog. He'll be like, wow, it's like a two-headed Gary. Like, obviously better than that. But they, there must have been some mandate where it's like, you can only have characters say a direct quote from their show. Because a fight will start up and Spongebob's text box will be, you know what's funnier than 24? 25. Uh, oh, yeah, that and, blows. Yeah, might have played too hard in the memes at that point. Oh, completely. I mean, Spongebob's taunt is straight up the... The friggin' chicken meme. Horrifying uh, eldritch horror. Ooh. But I think the game is super fun. Um, it's definitely the kind where you'll get most mileage if you can play that kind of thing over and over. Because there's not a ton of game modes. But I, and I don't think everyone would get their money's worth for it with that in mind. But as someone who can just explore arcade modes with different fighters over and over and over, I absolutely got enough fun time from this. Well, that's good. Yeah. All right. Uh, Will, I'll uh, I'll I'll put the ball in your court now. All right. Uh, so I've got a simultaneous toast and roast, and I would like to simultaneously toast and roast Kingdom Hearts. Um, mm. After Ooh. Sora got in, you know, uh, number one, I am glad that it's him because um, I'm so pleased that it's not a, sh- a sword and shield Pokemon because that's true. You know, I feel like Sora is basically the best way you could end it because he's the most requested fighter. Yeah. Um, makes me uh, dislike... You gotta be, it makes me dislike Bayonetta's inclusion even more, because Sakurai's just like, hey, you know, uh, we straight up lied that she won, but um, <laughs> uh, 
but that being said, you know, Sora came out and I played through the first Kingdom Hearts. Um, really stupid game. Um, the, the idea <laughs> of... <laughs> The idea of mixing Final Fantasy characters and Disney characters and also, you know, original OCs, it doesn't work, um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, it's The gameplay is good. Uh, the boss fights are fun. Um, the villains, oddly enough, are really well done to a T. Um, and I'd say as long as you can turn your brain off and just enjoy it that way, it's a really fun game. Um, I, uh, you know, went into it with very low expectations and was pleasantly surprised. Uh, I've heard, like, a lot of people are either like, Kingdom Hearts 1 is a, mas or is a masterpiece, or Kingdom Hearts 1 is aged poorly and is kind of bad. Um, so I was wondering what you'd think of it. Do you suppose there were, because I heard it was like a lot of TD, like, I feel like I heard from someone you couldn't skip the cutscenes, but you've told me that's not the case. You know, I played the final mix, and I think that adjusted some quality of life changes. Honestly, the biggest thing is I didn't know where to go half the time. There's no map, and the, the levels are very big, and oftentimes kind of look like certain areas will look very similar, so it's like, where the fuck do I go? Um, that's my big complaint with it. Did I, t did I ever tell you my, my, uh, how I tried to get into Kingdom Hearts? You never did. Um, I played the, I got the first one when it first came out. I was, understand I was rather young at this point. I never made it past the point where you're gathering, like, food that Kyrie and Riku want. Like, I specifically remember it was Riku's mushrooms that I could not find, and I never left Destiny Islands. Oh, wow, that's... That's, uh... <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I didn't really show you the locations of things, so. I know Kingdom Hearts 2 has a map, and I'm really looking forward to that one. I um, that one's great, yeah. Yeah. It, it's weird, I've been playing, um, because I got the complete collection for like 30 bucks, which is a steal. And the next game is, um, it's like a real-time card game called Rechain of Memories, and that's a lot of mm -hmm. fun. Um, but it introduces these, like, really cool, serious characters contrasted with Sora and Donald and Goofy behind them. <laughs> so it's, it's very hard to take the game seriously, and I think if you don't take it seriously, it's enjoyed the most. If you just be like, well, yeah, might as well. Um, it, it's a ton of fun. Um, if you can be like, yeah, you know, uh... Ursula wants to um, overrun the... Um, or if, if it's like, you know, Hades from Hercules hired Cloud from Final Fantasy to kill Hercules, um, and you're like, yeah, you know, may as well. It's, it's just kind of a lot of fun. Cloud is like one of your favorite characters. What did you think of uh, how he was depicted in this game? Uh, it's a bit of two lines. Um... You know, he is kind of edgelord, but I also think, number one, I actually really like the design. Um, it's a pretty great costume. Yeah. Um, you know, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. Obviously, I like, you know, regular Cloud, Remake Cloud, um, and even Advent Children Cloud more. Because the big thing is, this is a Cloud who hasn't lost anything. He never grew out of, you know the phase of, huh, I'm a soldier, and so he has to act like everything's too cool. Mm -hmm. Simply because Aerith is still alive in these games, which I... It, it's weird, because there's not many Final Fantasy characters. There's uh, Squall, and that's fine. You know, Cloud makes sense. Goofy, okay. And then there's Aerith, who's in every Kingdom Hearts. Uh, that, that just baffles me, because that Aerith is, is like... And that's the one big, like, even turning my brain off moment, I hate. I hate that Aerith is in these games because it undercuts Cloud's character so much. Because the big deal with Cloud is that he had to learn, you know, not to basically cut himself off and try to be cool because if he just, you know, if he, if he slacks, people die. And then here's Aerith and she's just kind of walking around having fun. It's like... I know, I think it's Kingdom Hearts... No, I think Chain of Memories brings in a couple more people from 7 and 2. I won't uh, 
I know I've seen like Remember? videos. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I don't think so. I just beat that game. Chain of Memories? Yeah. Doesn't that one have Sid? No. Okay, I played the Game Boy version. I wonder if he's like exclusive to that one. You know, um, he might be in Riku's. Um, uh, oh no, you know, Sid is in there. I just kind of forgot about him because he's only in there for like a few seconds. I think Tifa is in Kingdom Hearts 2. She is, yes. Well, then that's the one I'm playing. Mm-hmm. Um, no, but like, and it's also, I think it's a cool idea to have Sephiroth be, you know, a manifestation of, you know, Cloud's fucked up past. Um, mm. That being said, like regular Sephiroth a lot more. Um, but again, this is a game where, like, it's basically alternate history, because in the original Little Mermaid, Ursula isn't like, go, heartless, go um, kill this young little boy, voiced by Haley Joel Osment. Um, <laughs> but if you just turn it off and just be like, okay, it's own thing, it's its own thing, that's fine. Um, and with my Kingdom Hearts, um, you know, rant, dialogue, over, Davy. Cool. Okay. Time to roast a uh, a movie that I watched. So, um, I'm uh, sure you guys... going to talk about the Peppa Pig movie. No. <laughs> no. But, um, okay, I'm, I'm sure you guys saw the uh, the Lightyear trailer, and uh, it does look pretty good. I'm honestly kind of excited for it. Yeah, mm-hmm. same here. However, when I saw that trailer, I realized, hey, I actually haven't watched Toy Story 4 yet. So I went on Disney Plus, I watched Toy Story 4, and I just felt so empty when it was done. Hmm. I think I'm I'm with you, Dav. I'm with you on this one. I hate Toy Story 4. I I couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't know why. Because like objectively, it's a it's a decent movie. Like the animation's great. Uh the soundtrack, of course, is all there. Um, you know, it's fine. But uh I don't know. I felt empty after it. So what I did was I went and I went back and watched my favorite Toy Story movie, which was Toy Story 2. Mm, that's my favorite, too. And uh, I, because of Kelsey Grammer? I, I realized um, that Toy Story 4 is the complete opposite of Toy Story 2 in every single way. Mm, so basically the message of toy story four is completely flip flop from toy story two. Cause toy story two is basically like loyalty and, and stuff like that. Toy story four is about completely just throwing that out the window and going off to do your own thing. But like the, the biggest sin it kind of commits is that it, it like takes Jesse's backstory and just throws it in the trash. Remind me, why is that? What? Because Jesse's thing was that she was sort of abandoned and uh, had to go like be her own toy. Uh, they, mm-hmm. they put her in storage or whatever. Um, toy Story 4, of course, uh, is about the toys being like their own individuals and going off and living in the world somehow. Yeah. Uh, like, the, you know, the series kind of hypes up this idea that the toys kind of feel like this need to be played with and they have this loyalty to, to their kids. And Toy Story 4 is like, oh, but actually they can be individual and they don't need kids at all. And they can feel perfectly fulfilled doing that. So here's where I kind of... And, like, bear in mind, this isn't me being, like, the most ardent Toy Story 4 defender in the world. I think it's it's grand. It's fine. Um, I kind of can't help but feel, though, that there's a difference between being loyal to Andy would miss Woody and staying with Bonnie just because he feels he should when in reality she kind of just doesn't care for him as orbit as a thought that is I get that the the problem so my thing with that is I kind of expected that to happen just based off the ending of Toy Story 3 like I kind of expected he wasn't going to be the type of toy she was really going to want to play with forever mm-hmm. uh, the, the main thing though is I kind of wanted that to be uh, since this movie had to be like quotes had to be made um i i think that it would have been better delivered in terms of um like technology and toys in general mm. you know kids nowadays are not really into toys as much as they are into like ipads or whatever they're fortnites they're 
Yeah, because I, I mean, I think the implication or I think one of the directors or something said, like, we're not going to make another Toy Story unless we feel we have a story to tell. And I, I think that's like a totally missed opportunity. It's like toys today aren't as uh, like as important to kids. And sure, the timelines are kind of like screwed up in this movie. I'm not sure even when this takes place, mm. but I don't know. And that's obviously that's kind of a nitpick because it's, you know, something that doesn't exist, but um, I don't know. Woody has always been built up as this character. Who's like obsessed with uh, having a kid to make happy. And, and toy story two was kind of that sort of his character arc. Cause that's what he ends up with. And maybe it is loyalty to just Andy, but I, I don't know. It felt just super weird to me. It's watching like going from toy story four and then immediately watching toy story two like total complete difference. I mean, they couldn't be farther apart. Toy Story 2 is so good. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Ugh. Do you think so Bonnie has a Totoro toy. Do you think she's like a mini weeb? Could be, yeah. Could be. Um, yeah, that would make sense. Well, I, I kind of want to hear what you have to say, Will, since you don't like this movie either. Just feels completely soulless. Um, feels three was the perfect ending. Um, yeah, exactly. And this just kind of like ruins that ending. Because the ending of three is all like toys need to, you know, even if everything is against each other, they stick together. And then in this one, Woody's just like, well, guys, I'm going to go live with my girlfriend and we are going to run away. Um, I, I just felt like the message it was giving just wasn't done well. I, I was shocked to see that so many people loved it. I think it's just completely... I think it's just drivel. I know that's a very, you know... I don't use big words like that a lot, but that's how I feel. Yeah. I, big two-syllable words. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I well, think it's... My I words think... may not be multiple syllables, but at least my opinions are good, Tommy. Oh, ooh. Here's my thing. Here's... I think this came, this was like, this came out during the heyday of like completely unnecessary Pixar sequels. This is like right smack dab in the middle of Finding Dory and Incredibles 2. I think this is at least much better than those two. And I wonder if that helped that like has me look upon it more fondly. Really? I thought this was worse than both of them. I haven't no, seen Finding I, Dory, but I, I do agree that Incredibles 2 is worse. I think both of those are like dog shit. I mean, Incredibles 2, as a follow-up to the first Incredibles, is pretty bad, but, like, on its own, I thought it was better than Toy Story 4. I don't know. I don't know, man. I think, I, I mean, the, the original Incredibles is one of my favorite films of all time, so I think that's the reason why I hate Incredibles 2 so much. Same, yeah. Incredibles 2, like, is almost a half-assed cell phone's bad movie set in, like, what, the 1950s? Yeah, yeah that's kind of weird. You don't play <laughs> games, you watch game shows. <laughs> and Finding Dory isn't, like, awful, but it is a very nothing movie. I, got, I like, barely remember it. Did they find Dory? I think so. Yeah, yeah. That's about right. Yeah, I agree, though, that none of these sequels needed to happen. And that's my biggest problem with Toy Story 4. It really does not need to exist. And the fact that it does exist and doesn't actually send any important message is just kind of a sin to me. Yeah. I can, I can, I can, I can co-sign that. I didn't hate it like you guys did. But... We can all agree, though, that Frozen 2 is complete like dog oh. shit. I haven't seen it. I will probably never see it. I haven't even seen the first one, so I'm, I'm good it's with another, that. It's another... I'm going to compare it to Halloween Kills, because nothing happens in it. That sounds also, about I right. Mean, Ralph Breaks the Internet is maybe one of my least favorite films of all time. I think that's in, like, a league of its own of its badness. Yeah, that's probably the worst <laughs> out of all, uh, all the movies we've talked about so far. And I mean, I know that modern Pixar can do pretty good because I mean, Coco is a fucking banger. That's a fantastic ah, that's movie. A movie. That was good. And I yeah. haven't, I haven't seen Luca or anything, but I, I mean, I guess we'll see. Luca's, Luca's good. good. Yeah. All right. Um, but, really makes me wish that Italians were real. But anyways, uh, Gab, did you have anything else to say? Uh... <laughs> 
No, that's that's about it. I'll pass it off to Tommy. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of Italians not being real, I'm going to roast uh, The Many Saints of Newark. This is the Sopranos prequel film. I don't know if either of you have any uh, experience with The Sopranos. Nope. Not really, but uh, um, I didn't think that the prequel was going to be bad. Is it really bad? Oh, it's, it's not great. It's not awful, but it's pretty disappointing. Um, I'm trying, cause Sopranos, like, of, everyone says it's one of the best shows ever, and it really is. It's a phenomenal series. Um, I claim to be Italian all my life, but I don't think I was truly Italian until I watched The Sopranos. Um, and I guess the best way I can describe this is that it feels like. It feels like a fan's uh, it feels like a fan's grasp on what a soprano sequel could be and not necessarily the creators. Like you've got stuff like my biggest compliment is that this is an exceptionally well cast movie. Uh people resemble their younger selves as you would expect them. Uh Corey Saul plays Uncle Junior and he's oh, he's so much fun. I think he's great. It's uh James Gandolfini's real life son, Michael Gandolfini playing young Tony, and he looks the part, and he delivers the lines great. Who's uh, who's Tony's dad again? I really like that actor. Oh, uh, John Bernthal. Yeah, hell yeah, he's he's awesome. He's I'm I keep seeing I'm a little sick of seeing him in everything. Honestly, um, he's that's in fair, but <laughs> I only say that they, this movie barely utilizes him. Sadly, that's what kind of sucks. Um, that is a shame. Yeah, it's mostly Tony's uncle Dicky who seems to be his mentor, and he's like he's you might have seen. He's going, whoa, like, trying to be really Italian. And, um, the first, I guess, like, the, the, um, the tiny, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The singularity, the distillation of this movie is that the first big crime young Tony Soprano pulls off is stealing an ice cream truck. Which huh. is like, that's like a first draft whiteboard idea of, okay, uh, Tony Soprano's fat. I guess when he's a kid, he uh, steals an ice cream truck. I don't know. Skrillex <laughs> moment. <laughs> right. And there's just a lot of, um, I guess, uh, do we want to do... Sp- I mean, do learn? you think anyone in the audience actually cares about spoilers for The Many Saints it's, of Newark? It's free. You can go, it's free on HBO. You can go watch it. You basically learn, it's like... You basically learn that Tony's un- uh, two of Tony's uncles basically, um, I guess, little context. One of the big, anta- uh, arguably antagonistic figures in The Sopranos is Uncle Junior. He's one of the best characters. He's Tony's uncle, who's a bit older and a bit more tenured, and is plotting against him into his dementia. So he's like, he's gradually getting to an age where he can't remember why he dislikes Tony and wants to kill him to the point that there's this like shaking scene where uncle junior shoots Tony and can barely comprehend why. Oh, you learn, you learn in this movie that uncle junior had uncle Dickie killed because he laughed at him at a funeral. Like oh. it's bullshit. Um, uncle <laughs> junior, like it's raining and uncle junior slips down the steps. He says his favorite catchphrase. Ah, your sister's cunt. Um, and, uh, Uncle Dicky laughs at him, and it's treat. it's like, is that, there's, like, no other, like, you learn throughout the whole series that Tony lost this mentor figure, Uncle Dicky, and the reason it happened is because he laughed at Uncle Junior for breaking his leg. <laughs> it's kind of dumb. Ugh, that's pretty um, dumb. Yeah. Uh, there's some, like, it's perfectly, like, yeah, I there's some like cute moments there of like, oh, I know that character's name. It's funny to see them in the 60s and young. It's ultimately a very unnecessary movie, which surprised me because the creator of the show is directly attached to it. Really? Um, Interesting. Yeah. David Chase. I don't know what happened there. Um, it's a wholly unnecessary film, which seems to be a running theme in this particular podcast. Halloween Kills, Toy Story 4, Many Saints of Newark, the... Triforce of extraneity. extraneity. Uh, I'll pass it off to Will now. That's about all I've got for that one. All right. Yeah. Um, I would like to, I feel like I'm doing, you know, kind of dual toast roast. Um, however, I'm going to do it again. And yeah. that is because I would like to both toast and roast Star Wars Visions. 
Oh, okay. oh well, that's necessary because there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Um, Star Wars Visions is the most mixed bag show I've ever seen. Um, it's certain episodes are so fucking good, and then certain episodes I'm like, this is one of the worst things I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> kind of like Love, Death, and Robots. Yeah. Very much similar, uh, even though the second season of Love, Death, and Robots is basically entirely ass. Um, yeah. Probably one of the worst second seasons I've seen, but I digress. Um, very shocked to know that certain episodes I've hated are were well-received. Um, for example, my least favorite episode in the entire show is The Village Bride, um, which many people laud as the best in the show. Um, Genuinely can't imagine why it's really boring and doesn't really have many people or just where you've looked. I haven't met anyone who really I haven't met that many circles who really like uh, Village Bride. Uh, I just like, uh, you know, I've been looking like, OK, which episodes do people like? Everyone seems to love the Village Bride. It's, um, you know, it's not like, you know, bastardizes Star Wars. It's just really boring and doesn't really have a lot to do with Star Wars. It feels like, um, because the cool thing about Visions is that, like, you know, it should be Star Wars, but anime. But the Village Mm -hmm. Bride doesn't really feel like that. It just kind of feels like its own thing. And then, oh, there's a lightsaber at the end. Um, Yeah. Which a lot of the worst episodes, I feel, do that. Um... That being said, loved a lot of the episodes. Um, the duel was fantastic. Um, that's like kind of, I think, objectively the perfect episode because it is literally Ooh, Star Wars, favorite. but anime. Um, my so personal cool. favorite was The Elder. Um, that's good, yeah. Which uh, has David Harbour in the lead role, who does a fantastic job. Um, that is what Star Wars vision should be, in my opinion, because the main character is a Jedi, you know, they have pretty standard stuff, but it's done in the medium of anime. Um, bit of a mixed bag on the twins. I know that was kind of the most anticipated one because it's trigger. Um, I think the voice work is really well done, but I also think it's just kind of a, it's, it's very style, little substance. It is Trigger, after all. Yeah. Um, this is a mini roast for Trigger, but I, there's not a lot of Trigger show. I don't think I've ever loved a Trigger show. I've liked a lot of them, but it does kind of seem like, hey, look at these pretty colors. Um, you seemed awfully into Kill a Kill when we were getting into that one. Yeah, you know, I really liked that at first, and then it kind of, like, the end was really bad. Mm-hmm. It was pretty um, bad. I know... I know you're a big fan of the character Nui Harambe. Um, <laughs> and, uh, that's probably one of my least favorite characters in anime, unfortunately. Um, but back to Star Wars Visions. Um, I just think it's a very mixed bag. I think the episodes that did it right did it really well. The episodes that didn't, they're pretty bad. I think the Village Bride and the Ninth Jedi are the only ones I kind of take issue with. I, uh, what did you think of Tatooine Rhapsody? I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. I liked seeing Boba Fett, and I liked seeing Tamura Mor- uh, Morrison as him. I think that was a cool idea to do something that's not, like, in specifically with lightsabers and stuff. I, I liked well, that it was more about the lore. Absolutely. Um, some people took issue with how low stakes that one fell, but I thought that was like a perfect little respite. That was so much fun. Um, yeah, I mean, you can't always have like, oh, the fate of the gal, like, you know, it's yeah. fun. Boba Fett's after you, you know, yeah. you gotta sing. Um, Lop and Osho, everyone seemed to love that one. That one was very dumb to me. I um, like that one. That's... Yeah, that's uh, another where we differ. Dav, have you seen it at all? Uh, I haven't, but uh, I only just recently got my Disney Plus back, so I guess I'll check it out. You'll get a kick out of it, I think. It looks pretty good, but, you know, you know anthology series are kind of hard to pull off, I guess. They are always going to be mixed bags at this point. Even Black Mirror has just been sucking lately. Mm-hmm. The thing about, like, one thing about, because, like, there's ABCs of death and love death and robots is that whenever you, like, get separate people together, be like, okay, you each have this assignment. Everyone's going to try and one-up each other, and it'll come off as 
insufferable and over the top. I feel like everyone just loves Star Wars enough that people just made really cool stuff and there wasn't, like, as much a sense of competition. There's definitely some uneven uh, quality just by who did what. But ultimately, I, don't, I, did, I never got the sense that every director was like, ha, no one else is going to do this. You know what I mean? Yeah, it sure. just seemed like they all kind of enjoyed doing what they did. Is the one, uh, what did you think of the Astro Boy one? D- Toby? Uh, I didn't really care. I like that one. I like that one. It was fun that they were just like, we're just going to adapt Astro Boy into Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Oh, that was actually Astro Boy? Straight up, like, the, the, the professor in that is straight up the professor from Astro Boy. Like, not oh. even. Yeah, I fair enough. That, yeah, mm. um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, yeah, sorry, I, uh, you, you, uh, back, back to you. No, that's basically all I had to say. I'm good for, um, I'm good for passing it to Davey, if you've got any more. Sure. All right. I'm gonna give an extremely light toasting, like, just a tiny little bit of brown on the bread for inside job okay have you guys seen inside job i watched the first episode okay so uh just to give sort of a a basic synopsis um it's basically like what if all the dumb bullshit conspiracy theories people come up with were all true at the same time and there was an organization specifically made to control them and keep them hidden Mm -hmm. so it's it's actually a pretty interesting premise um, it's got that adult cartoon look to it, but uh-huh. it it's actually it's Rick and Morty style. Yeah, but it's actually pretty well animated for the most part. Like they try to do some stuff with it instead of just two talking heads just standing there and talking about whatever. The character designs are really good. Yeah, I mean the main character's great. Uh, they got like the himbo character in there who I love. <laughs> uh, and. I mean, overall, it's it's got some really good ideas. I think that the creator of Gravity Falls was lightly involved with it somehow, and that um, he, was pretty he cool. Produced it, and I think wrote a couple episodes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I mean, it's it's a, an interesting story. It's it's got some actually funny jokes in there, things that actually made me laugh. the The problem is with it, though, that it is extremely heavy on the references. Oh, that's what I've heard. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's insane. Like every opportunity they get, like uh, there's a <laughs> probably my least favorite moment is there's a there's an Asian guy in the group, right? Mm-hmm. And they have these two robots fighting each other. I won't go into spoilers, but they're like two robots fighting each other. And just as they're about to fight, it does a very quick cut to this Asian guy's face, and he just says, "Let them fight." <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Okay, honestly, but um, and then for some reason, there's a whole episode where they go to this town that is like stuck in the 80s and they try to make a ton of 80s references. But then they also like the message of the episode is that uh, nostalgia is uh, kind of a disease and making references isn't uh, the funniest thing. And the 80s are kind of overhyped, Mm -hmm. which is completely in contrast to all the references they make to the 80s and just media in general yeah so that was that was probably my least favorite episode but um it had a pretty good ending i'm looking forward to a season two if there is one it's uh i just kind of wish that they would have kept the good parts going for the most part because it really does just have some moments that drag it down it definitely does have that gravity falls dna i think the creator was a writer on gravity falls and alex hirsch helped out a bit so it has like it does feel like Gravity Falls meets Rick and Morty. I guess I watched the first episode. I, I thought it was neat. I just didn't uh, feel compelled to right away hit the next one. Something else must have distracted me. Do you think it's rewarding to go back and keep going up the hill? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's a good I think it's a good show to watch. It's uh, just, you know, be be aware that it's not going to be all gold or anything. It's it's probably yeah. a seven out of ten show. But uh, I think if they keep up, because it ends really strongly, so I think if they just keep that up and keep that full steam ahead into season two, then it's going to be a pretty great show. It struck me a little as having, like, expanded sitcom cast episode uh, episode syndrome, 
Whereas, like, I think that, like, they want to have this big ensemble of wacky characters, and it just doesn't feel like they always have something for them to do. That's true. Um, there, there are two characters in particular, the, uh, the Asian guy and then the, uh, the, the lady, token lady, um, who just kind of sit in the background and do nothing the whole time. The other characters are pretty great. But, I like that much from Alien. He's great. Yeah, he's he's fun. I I mean, they do some stuff with him. They do some stuff with the dolphin general guy. <laughs> but the the others just don't do much of anything. But I mean, the main character is fleshed out really well, and that's so interesting to see. And so is the himbo. I like their dynamic. I would want to see more of that. Yeah, it's a great dynamic to to lead the show. But uh, yeah, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's about all I have to say about the show, though. I mean, again, it's a very light toasting because it's it's good, but it it needs some work, I think, some refinement. So I'll pass the torch off to Tommy. Great. Uh, just checking in. There's like two more things I definitely, definitely want to talk about. Do you guys have? Uh, can you guys go on a little longer? Or do you want me to knock them both out? No, no I, I can go on longer. Oh, sweet. Okay. Oh, sorry. Will, what was that? No, go ahead. All right. Um. I watched last night in Soho last night, and I saw. I know Will saw this too. Yes. Ah, no, not last night. It was the night before. Regardless, I thought it was so good. Um, Edgar Wright, one one of my favorite directors, probably, and it's as pretty as any Edgar Wright movie. You've probably seen the preview for it. Um, in that it is a kind of mousy, shy woman who, when she goes to sleep, experiences the memories of basically a dead showgirl in the 60s. Um, and what follows is scary and stylish and a little bit of everything. I think it is so fucking good. Yeah, um, I actually just saw it earlier today. I have to give it a... I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, I think Matt Smith is probably the breakout performance from that. He does so well as the villain. Ah, uh, he's he's this big creep. He's awesome. He's fucking great. Yeah, <laughs> he's like he is like he kind of falls into the category of creepy handsome perfectly. And when the light hits him in a certain way, you're a little afraid of him. Yeah, no, he uh, I he was the only season of Doctor Who I ever watched, and he's you know wish I could see him in more. And it, this kind of just proves why he's so good. Mm-hmm. Um, the press I see hitting this film, a lot of people like it. But a lot of people walk away with, oh, it's a men bad movie. And those elements are definitely there. I'm not going to act like that. It's not. But um, what I feel like people are missing out on is that it is harshly critical of nostalgia um, and the romanticization of a past era. Because you have the main character, Thomasin McKenzie, who... Um, she is, like, obsessed with 60s culture and wants to... Oh, I, if I could live anywhere, I'd live in the 60s. Uh, she goes to college for fashion, and she's like, oh, I'm not like other girls. I don't fit in at parties. I don't like, I wish I could go back to the 60s. So when she wakes up and experiences life as a showgirl in the 60s, what I think that represents is that it takes an exceptional amount of privilege to romanticize a past era, and it's arguably kind of a slap in the face to people who suffered as you did back then you know what i mean yeah because she goes back there and finds out shit hasn't changed arguably it's gotten worse but going back to the 60s just because you're not partying the same way does not mean you're safe from predatory men or just the rampant sexism i thought that was just like such a beautiful like kind of a beautiful wake-up call it, it sucks for women today i'm not trying to defer that but I do think to like, oh, the beautiful time of the 60s is something that people needed to be waking up on. And I think this is a really cool way to illustrate that. Being said, the soundtrack is really good. I love the 60s. Oh, I love the 60s. I love 60s music. Um, so fucking good. I, I thought you hated the 60s. The music. I never said such a thing. Well, you probably did. We've listened to the monkeys together, sir. That is true. Yeah. This had All right, fair enough. Yeah, some monkeys in there, right? Huh? This definitely had at least a little bit of monkeys in there, right? I don't think it actually did. I just sworn. Hmm. Um. Oh, and Anya Taylor Joy is really good in it too. She is like 
exploding kind of out of nowhere ever since the Queen's Gambit, and she's awesome in this. Princess Beach. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I guess this also stood up. Have I ever told you guys about the Sam I Am test? No. So, we all watched Green Eggs and Ham. I don't know about you guys. When that plot twist happened with Sam I Am, I, f- I was like almost like, oh, what? This is kind of dumb. But I thought Green Eggs and Ham as a whole was so good. Yeah. That whereas where a plot twist like that could kind of mess things up in other cases, I thought they just earned a huge swing, even if it didn't land for me. And it didn't really damper the series as a whole for me. This has one of those moments. It passes the Sam I Am test, where they take a swing with a big plot twist, and I was a little, uh, I don't know how much sense this makes. But they do such a good job executing it and everything up until that point that I was completely on board within moments. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And, well, I don't, I don't mean this, the... I thought the climactic twist was amazing, don't get me wrong. It's the one before that. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah fair yeah, enough. That's where I was like, hold on, what? But then they kind of tie it back in with something really good at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Edgar Wright has such an eye for just bright, eye-catching movies. I think this is the first thing he's done where it's like, kind of bends into straight-up horror, and it gets fucking scary. Yeah, fair enough, honestly. Yeah. That sounds really good. I really want to see it. You should definitely check it out. It's This is probably my second favorite movie of the year now. And your first being? Uh, The Suicide Squad. Fair enough, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess if I gotta choose between this and The Eternals, I just I just don't know which one to choose. First, first rotten Marvel movie. I can't believe all collective Marvel movies said I have standards now. Um, uh, Will, I'll pass it to you now. Um, let me check my list. Let's see if there I can do a quick little toast and or roast. Um, I guess you know. I will, um, I'll toast Gantz. Yeah, can't believe right. I haven't mentioned that. Um, yeah. Tommy showed us Gantz Zero last weekend, um, and it was really good. Uh, it's just a really cool concept, and um, I, uh, I watched a Japanese dub, and the main character is voiced by um, Jotaro from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I believe his name's Daisuke Ono. Um, yeah. And that is easily one of the best performances i've ever seen in an animated film period um i think i know you guys watch the english dub um but i would honestly say it's worth going back and watching the japanese dub simply for him it is incredible um also been reading the gantz manga um little odd how different it is. Uh, Gan Zero takes place in what should be around, I think, chapter 240 in the manga. So it, bas- it literally takes place in the middle of things. Um, but That's what I thought, because, I mean, I really liked the movie. I just felt like I was dropping into the middle of a story when I watched it. So it was a little weird to me. Interesting. Just yeah. to show... Just to show my intuition, because I, I was fully under the impression it was the start of things. No, I mean, the main character... Gantz Zero is basically its own thing, because the main character of the manga um, isn't even in it. Um, also, there's around... I'd honestly say ten characters missing in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, the manga does some really weird stuff. You know, manga's ended a while back. Uh, there are vampires in the manga. And there's oh, also um, psychics. So... The manga is really weird, but the, the movie, I think, if you're looking to get a taste of Gantz, I'd recommend the movie. I know some really wacky, just, like, out-of-context Gantz spoilers, and I'm excited to just, like, see your reaction. Is there, isn't there, like, a panda at some point? There is, yeah. yeah. I lo- there's a bizarre number of anime and manga where there just is, like, there's... Jujutsu Kaisen, there just is a panda, and it's my favorite thing. They just work and Tekken, so well. too. Tekken, there just is a panda. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, but yeah, um, I just kind of, it's on Netflix. I'd recommend watching it. And now I recommend that Dav come up with something. Okay. 
Uh, gonna give a really, really hard fiery roast this time around. Uh, fuck the Nintendo Switch Online Plus expansion pack. Ah! I don't know why I just went there, but yeah, sounds pretty awful. I can't believe how much Nintendo has dropped the ball lately on pretty much everything they've done, but this is just insulting. Yeah, I know the the mods, the mods, I mean, they're basically mods. The ports barely work, I've heard. Yeah, they're straight up just shitty emulations that barely run. And it's, I mean, they're Nintendo 64 games, for God's sake. I yeah. honestly think we should have had these, like, 2018 it's it's ridiculous how long this has taken. I think getting rid of the virtual console is a really stupid move and that this is not a suitable replacement for it. Yeah, I'd rather just like, you know, buy individual games, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Like how how are you going to put Banjo-Kazooie on the Switch and not have me excited about it? That's so stupid. I you sh- I should never be at a state where I regret selling my Wii U in 2021. I'm I glad I still have it. <laughs> I, I could have a uh, virtual console, but I chose not to. Yeah, Wii U actually has great virtual console support. You can play DS games, for God's sake. You can play Wii games. It's just... How, uh, how did the Switch just drop the ball? And then, it's, and then they're basically making it redundant to buy, because it's like, oh, I could play N64 Mario Party, or I could buy... The remake of N64 Mario Party they just put out. Yeah, which is actually a, a pretty good game. I mean, it's it's a big upgrade over Super Mario Party. I, I'd, I'd recommend it. Dude, I was not going to pay full price for it. A fucking Space Land is one of my favorite things. I love it. I'm at least going to have to rent it. I might end up caving and buying it. Yeah, honestly. I mean, Nintendo games and sales don't really go together too well, but... Yeah, honestly, I <sighs> Nintendo just has been such a disappointment to me lately. I mean, this is sort of the cherry on top. It's honestly not the worst thing they've ever done, but it's it's an insult. It's a slap in the face. And they're making it really difficult for me to want to buy whatever the next console is. Because, I mean, I've been all in on the Switch since it came out, and I don't know, man. It's just they're letting me down big time. Nintendo's kind of a terrible company, unfortunately. They're the Disney of video games. Yeah. They are a company, after all, but... Like, I just yeah. I just got the Sega Genesis Master System collection and all the games on it for, like, ten bucks, and it's absurd that Nintendo is... Mm-hmm. Like, how, I don't know. Every other company's doing so much better in terms of backwards compatibility and retro support. There's just I, no I remember... excuse. I remember getting onto PlayStation Now for the first time and feeling like I was breaking the law. I was like, I I just have all these games. There's no fucking way. Because <laughs> I was just like used to the Nintendo bullshit for so long. I know, and it really makes you think. There really is no reason why older games need to be difficult to play. Mm-hmm. It's just Nintendo wants to create that artificial value to everything. So there can be a headline that says this ice climbers cartridge sold for thirty thousand dollars every five months. Yeah, uh, I mean, not even. I mean, in addition to that, it's also like, oh, Nintendo's wrapped up in a controversy. Let's just drop a game. Give them uh, Super Mario sixty four or whatever. Super mm. Mario in real life. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. I don't know. Well, I'm probably just going to keep ranting about that forever because I really could. So I'll just pass it off to Tommy now. Well, it'll circle back in the news columns I have, frankly. It'll come up. Yeah. You'll have your chance. <laughs> um, I've been replaying Twisted Metal for the PS3. Um, with the new TV show coming out kind of in the news, I was in the mood for it. And to be blunt, my ne- uh, I have a video essay in the works about it. So you'll see more about that soon. I felt the need to revisit PS3 because the sad thing is it deviated so much in formula from the prior installments that I kind of didn't give it the time of day, and I'm uh, pretty sure I sold it without uh, much guilt. But replaying it today, I, I feel really bad that I ever dismissed it. It might be the best Twisted Metal game. It's the one with only, like, three characters, right? Three characters, but you can mix and match their cars. 
Yeah, I... I, I, I always liked kind of that Twisted Metal has all these zany characters, so I do have to be totally. honest and say that, like, I probably wouldn't like... It. I mean, the gameplay obviously speaks for itself, but I do think it's a bit of a letdown that it's so few in content. I don't disagree, but here, um, they compensate it pretty well in that instead of 12 characters with an ending, it's those three characters have a prologue, middle, and ending, and then they all connect when you beat all three. Interesting, okay. Yeah, and those the three characters they picked, it's Sweet Tooth, Dollface, and Mr. Grimm. It's some of the best versions of those characters. They all whip ass completely. Uh, and then this version of Calypso is really good. They have these... Live action cutscenes that are clearly put in front of a green screen and look kind of hokey, but I feel it suits Twisted Metal in kind of a grindhouse way. I think it's super cool. Um, Interesting, okay. And it's J.S. Gilbert's Gilbert Sweet Tooth. He fucking rules. Um, this is also the only Twisted Metal game with dialogue while you're driving. Some of his moments, there's a point to take down a... Uh, I guess, for the context, all three of those characters I mentioned have a faction. So Sweet Tooth will have a goon in his sidecar sticking out his arm to fire a shotgun or something. Uh, in one of the bosses, you're fighting this big-ass armored truck, and you have to set a bomb on its sheet of armor before you can do actual damage to it. So Sweet Tooth's goon is like, I've got the bottom bomb, just drive me over and let me hook it up, and, I'll, and uh, you can come back and get me. Sweet Tooth drops off his henchman. The henchman needs some time to set up the bomb. And he goes, okay, boss, you can come get me. And then Sweet Tooth just has the detonator. And he's like, no, I've always wondered what it'd be like to murder with an explosion like this. And for some reason, just like that level of subversion in, um, in a Twisted Metal game, you just don't always get in some of the older installments is so phenomenal. And Sweet Tooth just kills his own guy. It's phenomenal. Um, I think what this game also does really well is that it, uh, shakes up the formula of Twisted Metal, the battles a bit. You can only do so much, um, variation on kill each other in this ring, you know what I mean? Like most other Twisted Metal games is it's level after level after level of kill all the other guys. This one introduces some alternate game modes that are really cool. Um, I just recently finished the Electric Cage match. You get put on this gigantic fucking map, and every, um, it's a huge map, and it, there's one small square, a green square, that you have to be inside. Uh, if you go outside of the square, you have a grace timer, and when that runs out, you start to take damage. And the square periodically moves. So you are always trying to get stressfully moving to wherever the fucking square is. And it's stressful and it's frustrating, but it is exactly the level of variation that keeps this from being you know, another Twisted Metal game where, oh, I just play through the whole thing. I kill people over and over and over. It's just the small level of variation that it needed. Fair enough, yeah. Yeah, I think it's because David Jaffe, who's he created Twisted Metal, he's honestly a little bit of a tool. I'm sad to report. Um, How come? Uh, he's kind of in favor of game development crunch by the sound of it. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. yeah uh, he's kind of, and he also like recently went off on this whole tirade about how he thinks Metroid Dread is poorly designed and it kind of just made him look like a jackass who doesn't understand games because like people were disproving his claims left and right. Um, he, he always goes off on, on about how people don't want to make Twisted Metal anymore. That's why we don't have a new one. But if this were a multiplayer thing with new online, it would, like, it would shake up that landscape. It would be great. Because the problem with Twisted Metal is that the single player feels unfair. Because it feels like a battle royale, but realistically, the computers won't kill each other. You can't just wait. You have to kill all of them. They're not going to hurt each other. In a setting where you could have that added le uh, layer of strategy where you're playing with six people online and they are all taking each other out, it would be phenomenal. So I don't know what he's on about with that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, fair enough. 
I think I heard an out of context clip from him about uh, when he was talking about Metroid Dread. I think he said something like, like somebody in chat said, this is how Metroid has always been. And he said, well, then it's shit. <laughs> uh, I mean, he's made God of War and he made Twisted Metal, so I can't twist the knife that deep, but he does seem like kind of a tool. <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah. I'm hoping that the TV show uh, brings back some more popularity and is maybe going to coincide with a new Twisted Metal game. Uh, I'm way back in the knee deep of it. I think that PS3 game is really good. <sighs> um, so I've got, you know, like I said, I can keep going on and on, but those are my burning, burning topics. You guys ready to move on to news or? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm good. All right. Okay. Sora is the final Smash fighter. We touched on this a tiny bit. I think it's a good choice. Basically the best way to end it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it's. Yeah. I think it's funny a, how. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Tommy. I should say there was a bit of a sobering sting that uh, my premonitions were incorrect, and it sucks that this is the last. No, it doesn't suck that this is the last one. I'm ready to move on. It sucks a little that um, basically a million dreams were crushed that day, and I was. It was hard not to be a little disappointed. It wasn't the fighter I wanted most, but seeing how ecstatic the Kingdom Hearts fans were, and apparently how well they tackled Sora in this, it was hard to keep feeling that way. I'm pretty happy that he's in this and that he's really good. Yeah, and I mean, a million dreams getting crushed was kind of inevitable no matter who it was. Yeah, um, exactly. I think it's funny how apparently Sakurai like was in... Um, the reason that he never put Sora in as the winner is because he just didn't ask. He was just like, <laughs> apparently... Again, this may be hearsay, but I heard that apparently he basically, like, saw that Sora won and was like, that's not gonna happen. And then he went with, like, I think it was at the Game Awards one year, and he went and, like, met with a Disney executive and he was like, yeah, I mean, Sora won the Smash Ballot, but that's never gonna happen. And the Disney executive was like, why not? And he's like, well, uh, I I mean, can we? And he was I like, sure. <laughs> I fully believe that. I mean, I would have done the same thing in his situation because that's that just sounds ridiculous. I don't understand how. Uh, I mean, anybody probably would have thought that was never going to happen. I mean, I just think it's weird how you didn't even ask. <laughs> and, and then again, the thing is too, Sora might not have actually won the Smash ballot because, as we've seen with Bayonetta, Mister Sakurai is capable of lying. Yeah, it was Goku. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Shrek. <laughs> uh. Sony forgets to release Hotel Transylvania 4. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, I heard about that. It's fantastic. <laughs> well, what, it was like, what happens? <laughs> it's awesome. There was just significantly... Um, just People seemed confused because there was some adverts that said it was going to Prime and some that said it was only in theaters. And then October 4th rolled around and there was no movie at all. <laughs> Really? They didn't you, say anything about it. It's just nothing. We're recording this on Halloween night, and there's still just no explanation. <laughs> so it's just like I guess it's just canceled. I get like there were like there were resp people were like my daughter was waiting to watch Hotel Transylvania four, and now she's crying. Just adding Amazon Prime, and they're just like, sorry, we're working on it, and it's still just not out. I mean, if your daughter is crying over fucking Hotel Transylvania, I, I would recommend, like, going outside. Dude, well, that, plus combined with the fact that I think Roblox is still down right now, it's just a horrible time to be a child. Yeah, oh. bad day to fucking be a kid. Oh, boy. Um, this one's mostly for me. Uh, Dragon Ball Super Superheroes trailer drops. And that's the worst title for a Dragon Ball film I've ever heard. But it looks pretty good. We saw Broly's feet in a really fast-moving shot, so he's definitely in the movie. And it looks like the Red Ribbon Army is back in the fold, so that has me pretty amped. Uh, I'm ca the CGI style uh, is raising concerns for some. I'm willing to give it a shot. I think if... Um, if uh, oh my gosh, the newest Ghibli film in CGI style has anything to say, that's worrying. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. I mean, Dragon Ball has been CGI. I mean, half of my Dragon Ball content has been video games, and that's all CGI, and I never had a problem with it then, so I'll give it a shot now. Wasn't uh, Lupin the Third the first uh, actually pretty decent? That was great. I like that one. Yeah, so, I mean, that's there's the opposite of uh, 
Earwig and the Witch is, is in terms of quality. <laughs> Earwig and the Witch, it didn't even look bad. It was just boring as sin. It it does look pretty bad, actually. I think it looks pretty bad. You think so? I The animation's kind of janky and looks a little unfinished most of the time. I guess I'd have to take a closer look. It was a hard movie to pay attention to. Uh, first images of Timothy Chalamet as Wonka release. Um, I'm going to give that a solid I don't care. <laughs> Why do we need was... a standalone Wonka movie? We don't need half the movies we have recently. Just, how was uh... he... Well, how was he in Dune, Will? Does that like... Because you saw Dune. He was good, but like, I'm not going to see this movie because he's in it. It just seems um, like a pointless swatch. Yeah, honestly. Um, I wonder, how are they going to handle him picking up the indigenous Oompa Loompas? That's going to seem really tasteless. There's going to be a message there. I know there's going to be something there. I don't know yeah. what it's going to be, but we'll see. Uh, going to handle very poorly. Animal Crossing news drops. Ooh! Yeah. Pretty spice. Um, I made couple. I made a video over the summer about what I would do with an Animal Crossing title. The update almost eerily gave me what I wanted. Yes, I agree. But at the same time, this is another case of where I think this should have been in the game, either from the start or much sooner. No, I don't disagree. Yeah. Um, I've... What I always, always wanted was to not be shackled to just ten... Like, the villagers are my favorite aspect of Animal Crossing. I love exploring, exploring their different aspects and, you know, just seeing all the different things they do with just those eight personalities and handful of animals. The happy home stuff giving you a chance to play with more than just your ten villagers and in a really cool way with the decoration, it's precisely what I wanted. I'm actually really amped for that. Oh, hell yeah, I'm all for that. I mean, it's it's a really good deal, too, because if you think back to New Leaf and then Happy Home Designer being separate games, it's pretty cool that they're, like, putting it as part of the game. Which of the new villagers is your favorite? I like the, uh... I don't remember his name. Oh, wait, no, yes, I do. Uh, Cephalobot. Cephalobot. <laughs> I, I want time him. They had another, it's about time they had another octopus. Um... I think Sasha's pretty great, but Marlo is, like, the champion for me. The hamster that looks like Marlon Brando. That sounds pretty awesome, but I don't remember that. You'll have to... You'll see him. You'll see him. All right. Uh, I have a bulletin here that just says, The state of media labor is bananas. <laughs> uh, we are in a shift, folks. Uh, the ISATE has gone on strike. What is the ISATE? It's a... It's, one of the actors' guild, one of the um, entertainment media guilds. I should probably know more about this if I'm talking about it. But lots of writers, editors, and actors are going on strike. And in the midst of all this, everyone's horror stories are just coming out. Um, Ruby Rose, who played Batwoman for one season, I, I'm eating my lumps here because when she dropped out of that role, everyone was talking about how, oh, she was ever actually that good she probably just couldn't handle the credit and i was also kind of rolling my eyes there she released some truly terrifying stories of what it was like on the set of that show hey yeah, i um, like the dude whose face melted off or the people becoming quadriplegic doing just trying to help these shows happen and like you know, it's like it's the next level up of the video game crunch conversation where it's like it's hard not to think of, oh, I love I love this character in this show. How many people behind the scenes were miserable making it the way it needed to be? It's not even a good show. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I watched a little bit of Batwoman. Yes. It's no Supergirl. And I'm going to get crucified for saying that. That Supergirl's on its last season. I don't think Supergirl's good either, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, oh, just the thought of becoming it. quadriplegic for a show like Batwoman, that just makes me think that there is no God. DC Fandome happened. Were you guys up on this? I only Not saw, like, the Black Adam stuff, and I feel like they didn't talk, they talked about Flashpoint, but that's it. Uh, let's see, there's some really, we got the Black Adam trailer, 
that looks cool. Looks as awesome, shit. yeah. Um, it's got like Pierce. Bro- it's like Pierce Brosnan is Doctor Fate, and he's joined by Cyclone, Hawkman, and Adam Smasher in a movie called Black Adam, which tells me four heroes are gonna fucking die, and I am all for it. I love a good anti-hero story like this. Yeah, that's why you like Venom so much. Yeah, don't, 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 don't go there, Mister. I think DC's um, doing some good stuff lately. It's sort of flip flopped where Marvel's the bad one now. Um, we got there's the League of Super Pets cartoon movie, which you know, obviously very different from everything else, and it's gonna be goofy and kitty. But I actually think it looks kind of cute. Isn't the Rock in that too? Yes, the Rock is Crypto, and Kevin Hart is Ace the Bat Hound. Oh. Man, The Rock is just, like, freaking monopolizing every DC property. <laughs> he's, mono- he's probably the biggest movie star in the world at the moment. I'd say so, yeah. Um, I love Ace's design. He's, fi- he's always been, a, I think, a, is it a German Shepherd? Uh, I think a German Shepherd. But he's always kind of just looked like a retriever hound, because people don't want to give him those big cartoony flaps. Because it would make him look a lot less graceful. This movie gives him these big old bulldog flaps, and it's one of my favorite designs in a long time. He looks phenomenal. Um, try think there was the Supergirl farewell because that's on its last season, and I cried a little bit. Uh, only person in the world who did. There's another movie. I wish I wrote down what it was. Cause the Batman. Sorry. The Batman. The Batman. That looks fine. I'm actually not as amped for that one. I'm just, I heard that someone said it is a straight up horror movie, and that has me excited. That being said, I'm tired of Batman just being a copy of the Nolan films. Yeah. We have the Nolan films. We don't need, like, dark, gritty Batman. We don't need every Batman to be dark and gritty and depressed. Like, right. Um, I think. I think Colin Farrell looks really good as the Penguin. I agree. Yeah, that's the one thing. Because I think the Riddler looks stupid. I, I don't have much of an opinion on him, yeah. Um, okay, I, I recovered a couple... So we're getting an anime Catwoman movie. People who made... It was like, people who are involved with Lupin the Third are making this. That has me so excited. Oh, that does sound good. Yeah, um, Elizabeth... Uh, Elizabeth Gillies, I think that's how you say her name, is Catwoman, which seems like a match made in heaven, too. Should be a direct adaptation of the Halle Berry movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. But okay, guys, the Peacemaker show looks so good. I don't like John Cena anymore, so I don't know. Jux, I don't know. I, well, now I look bad, but I'm all for it. Um, looks really good. He has, he's got Vigilante in there. He dances in his underwear to the choir boys. I'm going to be there. I just loved Suicide Squad so much. I, I'm so happy we're already getting a continuation. Yeah, I did really like the Suicide Squad, so I'm it's, I'm all for yeah. more of that. Enjoyable. Oh yeah, he's gonna. I know. I don't know much about Vigilante as a character, but it looks like they're working together. And I know Peacemaker is a villain of Vigilante, so they're gonna turn on each other. It'll be messy. It's gonna be good. He's got a chainsaw in it. Ah, I'm there. Uh, I guess that's all the big DC. Let's see. Sorry, my list. Uncharted trailer. What do you guys think? No, it looks bad. Looks bad. <laughs> looks really bad. Um, it looks like if Nathan Drake in the games was like, "Ugh, they made a movie about my life," and that's what he like sits down to watch. That sounds very accurate. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm not as huge of a Tom Holland hater as like you are, but that's terrible it's casting. Okay. You put me in a bad position framing that with no context. <laughs> I don't like the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, and I think he's kind of too much in everything. I'm sure he's a perfectly nice guy. Yeah, he seems like a really nice guy. I just don't think it's right casting. Oh, him in that tuxedo looks so ridiculous. I I don't like Mark Wahlberg as uh, Sully either. I think that's just (laughs) not good. Mark Wahlberg, what a tool. Um, He's a tool. (laughs) (laughs) I'll, I'll, ugh, that's where I draw the line, yeah. Um, and then the Lightyear trailer. We touched on this a bit, too. I think this looks pretty cool. It looks really good. I'm really hoping that they do some good stuff with it. Yeah. 
I'm um, a bit confused as to where it fits in the Toy Story lore, though, because some people are saying like it's canon to that universe, and other people are saying it's like a, a movie within that universe. I heard that it's like a movie within that universe. That makes the most sense to me, because there's all the sci-fi shit, and I can't see that happening before Toy Story. Right. I, I almost you wonder... got a friend in me. I like. I think someone just tweeted, "Man, I feel sorry for actors today." And it's uh, is it who's is it which is the Chris's? Is it? Uh, Evans, I think. Yeah, it's Chris Evans having to say like, "I'm not playing Buzz Lightyear. This is the real guy he's based on. He's <laughs> <laughs> not a guy. It's Bozo. Bozo did the dub." Um, <laughs> I think. Um, like I'm a big fan of space operas like that. Like I loved 2001, love Interstellar. So if it's anything like that, I am super excited. I feel like. The most exhausting thing is going to be that this is attached to Toy Story. I almost wish it just had a different name. And I wouldn't have my bingo sheet out for when Buzz inevitably goes, Well, as a kid, I always liked Pizza Planet. I don't know. Undoubtedly something they'll do. But I'm all for it. It looks really good. Yeah. All right. Well, that covers our news. I keep, um... I remember for our first episode, obviously no one was able to listen, so we didn't have a question panel. Then we forgot to in the second episode, where people did seem to listen and comment. So I've screwed <laughs> this over once again. So, All right. So, so I'll hope. So let's hopefully people leave questions for this one. We can end off on a cheeky little uh, question block. Wait, did, can we answer the questions from the previous video? No, that's the thing. There wasn't one because yeah, we didn't. We didn't ask if if oh. uh, anybody had questions. We asked for questions in the first one, and no one asked any, because we're just starting off. We get comments on the second episode, and we failed to ask for questions. Damn it, okay. <laughs> so, that's the state of affairs now. Maybe, uh... Worst case, I'll just ghostwrite some questions for the next one, pull a William Shakespeare. Perfect, yeah. Them, like, why does Tommy Fair sound enough. so handsome on the air? And I'll be like, well, dear viewer, that's those are my own secrets. Hair tonic. Get the ball rolling. Yeah. This has been West Coast Toast and Roast. Happy Halloween, as you're listening to this in November. Happy Halloween and a Happy New Year. Uh, Hubie Halloween. <laughs>